This book is full of spiders. 27 hours prior to outbreak. We arrived on the hospital grounds to see that all hell had broken loose. Six cop cars were parked haphazardly around the emergency room entrance, lighting up the parking lot like a dance floor. There was an ambulance, its rear doors open. People were spilling out of the hospital entrance, their heads down like they were running the trenches in a war zone. One lady came out in aqua blue scrubs, one side of her blonde hair matted down with blood. There was a clump of onlookers on the far side of the lawn that included three or four wheelchairs, maybe 50 yards away from the hospital. It looked like they were gathering patients there, getting them away from the building. One cop was talking to them and gesturing with his hand, karate chopping the air with each barking command. His other hand held a pistol pointed at the sky. Pop, 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 pop. More shots from inside. John, possessing a genetic defect that makes him walk toward danger, strode down toward where it looked like some cops were trying to set up a perimeter around the chaos. Somewhere, Charles Darwin nodded and smiled a knowing smile. We came upon two cops blocking the sidewalk, a fat black one with glasses and an older guy whose face was all mustache. John stepped off the sidewalk as if to walk right past them on the grass. Black cop put out a hand and told us to stop, in a tone that suggested that if we didn't, he would taser us until our blood boiled. We backed off, stepping aside as paramedics hustled a bleeding head lady past us. She was crying, holding her head, saying over and over again, He wouldn't die. He just wouldn't die. They shot him over and over again, and he... John tapped my shoulder and pointed. A boxy truck was pulling up, blue with white letters on the side. I thought it was some kind of paddy wagon, but when the door opened, a SWAT team spilled out. Holy shit. John moved off the sidewalk and up onto the lawn in front of the building. There were some benches there and a ten-foot-tall bronze statue of a lady in old-timey nurse's garb holding a lantern. Florence Nightingale? I followed John and we joined a small crowd of onlookers. Gunshots. Rapid shots. Dozens of them. Gasps from the audience. I could barely see down there, but I could make out people running out of the building, frantic. One lady fell down and got accidentally kicked hard in the face. Then, a man came out supported on the shoulders of two hospital staff, his right leg missing from the knee down. Or at least that's what it looked like. Keep in mind we were still far enough away that the door looked about the size of a postage stamp, and I was trying to look through a grow growing crowd in front of me. That's why I can't be totally sure about what happened next. First, a man in a black SWAT outfit came running out of the building, screaming something. I couldn't hear him from where we were standing, but to this day John insists the man was screaming, run away. Then shots, loud, sharp, close. Next came the screams. Screams from every single human being close enough to the lobby to see what was going on. Three cops near the entrance ducked behind the parked patrol cars and trained guns in the sliding doors. A man lumbered out. Every gun barrel followed him. It was Officer Frankie Burgess. Burgess. He was wearing his cop uniform, pants, and a red shirt. No, that's not right. It was a white undershirt, stained with blood over 80% of its area. People crowded around, blocking my view. John craned his neck and said, it's Frankie. Everybody's got their guns on him, like he's dangerous. Did he shoot all those people? Hey, move, buddy. I, I can't see. Frustrated, John went to the nurse statue and, to my horror, climbed it. He got up to where both hands were on his shoulders. On her shoulders. His shoes planted on her forearms. Florence's face was planted in John's crotch. I waved at him. John, get down from there. I can see him. It looks like they're talking to him. I don't see a gun. Oh, shit, look at his arm. Dave, his right arm is broken. And I mean, it's almost broken at a right angle. And Frankie doesn't even act like he cares. Oh, oh wait, something's going on. A cop voice from nearby said, Get down from there, you. You, get down. John ignored him. A burst of gunfire. Everybody ducked. They're shooting him, shouted John. They're shooting a lot. You can see bits of him flying off. He's still up. Holy shit, he's... Holy shit! He just grabbed one of the SWAT guys. He grabbed him by the ankles and he's swinging him around like a baseball bat. He's knocking the other guy down. Bullshit. John, get down from there. He's biting a guy now. He's eating him. A cop. He's got him by the neck. What? More shots. Screams. Suddenly I was awash in a panicked current of swinging elbows and shoulders. John jumped down from the statue and ran with the crowd as fast as he could. Over his shoulders he yelled, Dave, he's coming. I took two steps and somebody slammed into me. My face bounced off wet grass. I climbed to my knees in the stampede. A woman nearby screamed at the top of her lungs. I spun and, between running fingers, saw a shirt stained red with blood. Frankie. Standing right there, left arm jutting grotesquely just under the elbow, blood dripping in the grass from a protruding shard of bone. Police were shouting in the distance, commanding us to get down. How did he beat, how did he beat them here? He cleared half a football field in five seconds. 
Frankie's torso was riddled with puckered bullet wounds, leaking red. His chest heaved with excited breaths, his punctured lungs whistling with each inhale. The broken arm was moving, twitching, the bones tearing free of skin and curling like tentacles. What the shit? Cops ran into position. I saw one SWAT guy fumbling to cram a new magazine into the little submachine gun he had. They shouted orders at each other and at the crowd. Frankie opened his mouth, opening wide like a yawn. Just for a second, I thought I saw the face of the spider, nesting there behind his teeth, filling the cavity with its black body. Then, Frankie the monster let out a noise like I had never heard before. It was a shriek, like microphone feedback, but more organic and pained, like the sound of a whale would make it if it were on fire. The ground shook from it. My bowels quivered. I think I shat a little. I saw people hitting the ground all around me, saw guns fall from the hands of cops. I clapped my palms over my ears as the pained shriek of Frankie the monster filled my bones. Frankie's back arched, his mouth open to the sky, howling. Blood was spurting from a dozen bullet holes. It was the last thing I saw before the world swam away and went black. I came to and sat up. People were standing around, nobody running, no sign of Frankie. Some time had passed. The horizon was shitting a sun, casting a glow on a layer of fog that was settling in the low areas like puddles of ghost piss. I saw John about ten feet away, on his feet but bent over at the waist, gripping his pants at the knees. He was blinking as if trying to focus his eyes. John, you all right? He nodded, still looking at the ground. Yeah, I'm thinking that sound he made melted our brains. Did they get him? Don't know. I just came too. A white truck pulled up with a dish apparatus in the back. It had a TV station logo on the side. We were about to be on live TV. I tried to fix my hair with my hands. Hospital staff and aqua scrubs were walking people back into the building. It looked like every policeman in the state was here, taking statements from people. I realized John and I should probably get going before we got asked a bunch of questions that, once again, we didn't have any non-crazy answers for. Not just about tonight, but everything. I turned toward John, but John wasn't there anymore. I went looking for him, giving one pair of cops a wide berth along the way. I thought about just going home without him, but then I saw him standing out by the street and talking to a goddamned reporter. I stomped over there, walked right in front of the camera, and was about to grab him by the collar and drag him away when John said, Oh, shit. I followed John's gaze and said, Oh, shit. The reporter lowered a microphone and said, Oh, shit. Army guys. A lot of them. National Guard, I guess. They were wearing that grayish urban camel they wear these days. They had parked a green truck across the intersection where the hospital driveway met the road. Cars were lined up trying to get out, and soldiers were going down the line and issuing instructions to angry drivers. Up by the truck, a soldier raised a bullhorn and said, Attention! Do not leave the area! There is a significant chance you have been exposed to a contagious pathogen. Leaving the area could lead to spreading the infection to your family and friends. By order of the Centers for Disease Control, you are not to leave the area. Please go back to the lobby of the hospital, where you will be given further instructions. This is for your own safety. We apologize for the inconvenience, and you will be released as soon as it is determined that you do not pose an infection risk to those around you. Thank you for your cooperation. If you attempt to leave the area, you will be prosecuted. Do not attempt to leave the area. John tossed down a cigarette, stamped it out, and said, Let's leave the area. Yeah. We left the reporter behind and circled around, looking for a way out. We found the ambulance-only entrance around the block and had a Humvee across it. The soldiers were forming a perimeter, camouflage dots looping around the grounds. We looked around behind the building, where there was a little strip of wood separating the hospital grounds from town. Same scene, with the addition of some guys unloading spools of razor wire from the back of a truck. John spat and said, This might sound like an odd thing to say right now at this moment, but I wish those guys were wearing hazmat suits. Yeah, or at least something covering their mouths. There wouldn't happen to be a door around here, would there? A door? You know, one of the... Oh, there's not one in the hospital as far as I know. That would have been awfully convenient, though. John thought for a moment, then said, What about BB's? It's right on the other side of the trees there. BB's was a convenience store about two blocks away, on the other side of that little wooded area. Among those trees was a deep drainage ditch we'd also have to cross. Man, I don't know. He edged around and get a closer look at the guardsman standing between us and the woods. He said, Come on. We wait till the guy goes to help unload some more of that wire, then run right through the gap there. But if we're going to do it, we have to do it now before the sun comes all the way up. And what makes you think those other guys won't shoot us in the head? 
They're not going to do that. All these guys know is they got up in the wee hours of the morning to fence off a hospital because a guy went on a shooting rampage and they're afraid some disease may have escaped. They don't know there's a, you know, monster situation going on. And you know all of that how? TJ Fryer is over on the other side. You remember TJ? Came to that party a few years ago and stuck his dick in the jelly? He's like a sergeant now. So they haven't been told shit. Well, they're going to chase us. Yeah, but we just got to make it to BB's. John stripped off his shirt and started wrapping it around his face like he was ready to join some riot in the Middle East. Cover your face, unless you want them to identify you and show up at your house in an hour. Peering through a quarter-inch slit of wrapped t-shirt, we crouched low and stayed in the shadows until we reached the narrow stretch of lawn between us and the woods. We stayed like that for about 15 minutes until one guard left his post to accept a cup of coffee from another. We sprinted. I immediately slipped in the wet grass and fell on my face. My shirt mask slipped over my eyes. I scrambled to my feet and, ju and just ran, as hard and fast as I could, nearly blind. I heard shouted commands, but no gunshots. A branch slapped me in the face and I knew I'd reached the woods. I stumbled and clawed the shirt away from my eyes just in time to feel the ground give way under me. I was sliding down an embankment of wet grass and dead leaves, then splashed into freezing ankle-deep water. It was dark. There had been an early morning gloom out in the lawn, but it was still midnight under the trees. No sign of John, or anybody else. I sloshed to the water and scrambled up the other side, pulling myself up with handfuls of weeds, knocking aside discarded grocery bags and flattened plastic Coke bottles. A hand latched around my ankle. A different hand latched around my wrist. John up top, one of the soldiers on bottom. For a ridiculous moment, I was pulled in opposite directions like a cartoon character, both men shouting frantic instructions at me. I tried to kick free and accidentally kicked the guy in the head in the process. It worked. In three seconds, John and I were out of the woods and sprinting diagonally across the parking lot, through the bay of a car wash, down an alley and toward the gray bricks and rusting dumpster that was the ass end of BB's convenience store. I risked to look over my shoulder. Shit! There were no fewer than ten soldiers following us now, the two in the lead carrying black plastic pistols with neon gripped green tips. They looked like toys, but I knew they were tasers. I was eager to avoid my fifth lifetime tasering if at all possible. The restroom door was on the exterior of the store, around the corner to our left. I rushed up to it, grabbed a rickety knob, and... Locked, I said, trying to catch my breath. The key! Inside! You have to get the key from, from the counter inside! John shoved me aside, reared back, and kicked the door. The whole knob and latch mechanism exploded. We crammed ourselves inside, pushing the broken door closed. One. Two. Three. Hey, you two! Get the fuck out of there and lay the fuck down on the pavement before we have to- The soldier was caught off in mid-word. I pulled open the door to find we were surrounded by panties. We stepped out of the ladies' dressing room in the Walmart on the opposite side of town. John and I had traveled about 2.5 miles in approximately zero seconds. Right now at BB's, several very confused National Guardsmen were staring at an extremely filthy and completely empty public bathroom. We stepped inside the aisle of the nearby empty store. Two muddy men with t-shirts wrapped around their heads. John unwrapped his and said, What is, what is this? Walmart? So... I wasn't completely honest with the psychiatrist about the whole thing with the mysterious door and the burrito stand and the Asian dude who just disappeared into it. John and I had identified half a dozen of those doors around town, and we know where they lead. To each other. The only thing is, you never know which of the other doors they were going to take you to. It was basically doorway roulette. I mean, you're not going to step out in Beijing or anything. It's, another, it's always another door around town, all the ones we found anyway. But they never seem to go in the same place twice. Why? Because this whole town is fucked up, that's why. I keep trying to tell you that. You don't want to come here. It's exhausting. John and I didn't draw much attention as we moved through the stores, since at this particular store in this particular town, we weren't even the filthiest people there. We just walked right out of the front door and headed back down toward along the shoulder of the highway. It was a wet, chilled morning under a lethargic November sky that had rolled out of bed and thrown on an old, gray, grease-stained t-shirt. John said, Did you hear? They never found Frankie. Wonderful. What do you think happened? You think that bug thing took over his brain? Hey, why not? You think he's going to turn up again? If you're asking yourself why the men with guns chasing us couldn't just use the magic door and follow us right to Walmart, it's because for most people the doors are just doors. Same as for most people. The spider monster in my house would have been invisible, just as it, had, just as it was for Frankie. Same as how if you'd been in the bathroom with me all those months ago, when I saw that shadowy shape outside my shower, you'd have seen nothing. You might have sensed something. Just as in your everyday life, you might sit in a dark house and feel like you're not alone. 
or have a nagging suspicion that something slept around a corner just a moment before you looked. The feeling can usually be expressed by the phrase, of course there's nothing there. Now. To be clear, if you've actually seen a ghost, that doesn't make you like us. A ghost sighting is usually nothing more than your brain trying to put a familiar face in something that does not have a face at all. John and I, on the other hand, can see what most of you can only sense. We're not special. It's just the result of some drugs we took. Just for future reference, if you're ever at a party and a Rastafarian offers you a syringe full of a slimy back substance that crawls around on its own like the blob, don't take it. And don't call us either. We get enough bullshit from strangers as it is.